Hi, today's topic is belting. What exactly is belting? Essentially, it's bringing your chest voice up and extending it into a higher part of your range. For male voices, that's kind of in the upper passaggio area of your voice. And for female voices, that's normally where you would be mixing. I would suggest watching my chapters on male vocal registers and female vocal registers just to get more familiar with the terminology. Male singers normally sing, this is the larynx by the way, normally sing with a dominance of thyroarytenoid muscles, TA, and those are the white muscles here. Female voices in head voice normally sing with a dominance of cricothyroid muscles, which connect the cricoid to the thyroid. So when females are singing in chest voice, they're using these more, and then when they switch into head voice, they're using these more, which is why that break can be more pronounced in female voices, because there, there's a real serious register shift going on there. Belting is used in several styles of music, but particularly pop and musical theater. It is less formal than classical singing. The vowels aren't as pure. Most of the vowels are going to be in the front of the mask. And some vowels are more spread than they would be in classical singing. Belting needs to be done in a healthy way. You have to learn how to support and place your sound and know your registers before you really start belting. It can damage your voice if you do it in the wrong way. So I never start with belting with a student. I make sure that their technique is really instilled first, that they have options with their registers, and then that's something that we can focus on after that's all in place. When I'm teaching belting, I make sure that students have vocal options so that if they have a gig and their voice is really tired or they're sick and they're supposed to be belting on a high note, that they can approach that either in head voice or mixed, and trying the same pitches three different ways. So here's a student, this, is, this clip's in a different video as well on registers, but here's a student trying three different approaches to the same exercise in head voice and mixed voice and chest voice. Make sure the voice is fully warmed up before you start belting exercises. I like to do descending and ascending exercises to get that process going and bringing more mix equality into the low voice before adding the chest voice into it. Here's a mezzo-soprano doing some descending exercises, keeping a real mix in her voice. Here's another student demonstrating the same exercises in chest voice and in mixed voice, going over that register shift where the action of thyroarytenoids changes to cricothyroid. Finding front placement or ring in your mask is really crucial in belting healthily. 
if the sound is too far back, you're going to be pushing from your throat and get really, really tired. In classical singing, we have front vowels and back vowels. And in belting, most of the vowels stay front vowels. And they don't get the same space and the same rounding that they do in classical singing. Ah vowels, for a lot of women, are tricky because the sound wants to fall back. But in chest voice, the ah vowel tends to stay forward, which is why a lot of males like singing on ah vowels. So I use ah vowels a lot for a female chest voice to kind of pop the resonance into place because it lets the jaw drop, it adds a little bit of space, as opposed to an e vowel, which can get a little tight and narrow sometimes when we're trying to belt. Here's a student whose placement wasn't quite locked in, and then you can hear the moment that it does lock in, and suddenly the belt is much more powerful and strong. So if you think of a bright Italian ah vowel, right behind the front teeth, ah, and I'm from Boston, so it's easy for you to do that. <laughs> we don't use our R's. Um, so, but yeah, ah, uh, yeah, so right behind the front teeth, you don't need to round your lips to, to do this. Okay. Ready, and go. That was totally different. Okay, like, I like try to focus on like finding the resonance to hide my teeth. So. That was right. That, that was, was my old high school fire director. Talk. She was like, sing from the back of your teeth. So. Okay. okay. Yeah. You <laughs> I didn't know it. what that meant, but that makes there sense now. <laughs> And that's going to give your voice a lot more power. There are some exercises that can work for both male and female voices for belting. A descending exercise I like to do, and I mentioned this in the range extension chapter for male voices, is ba, getting a lot of energy behind that B. We're going ba. And that can work for female voices as well. So doing a descending exercise on that, getting a nice bright vowel and all the energy behind that plosive B. I like to use plosive consonants for upper male extension and for belting as well. So here's a student demonstrating that particular exercise. Uh, Let's use a lot of B. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, good. Ready. Several years ago now, I had the great privilege of being the voice teacher of Sean Doherty, who is a ridiculously talented tenor based in New York City. He's having a thriving career in musical theater and pop. And we spoke the other day via Zoom, and I asked him some questions about how he approaches belting. As a professional singer, how do you keep your voice healthy, especially when you're belting? Yeah, um, sleep. I find sleep is like, for me, especially as I've gotten a little older, like I, that is the one thing where if I don't get a good night's sleep, I can't. Like if that's the, if my voice is the first thing to go, I feel exhausted. And so for me, like I am now a strict eight hours a night per person. Like that was the number one thing for me that I found has been a huge difference in my singing career. Um, and it's really hard with me with, um, I do a lot of traveling for guest entertainer work. And so, I mean, not now, obviously, but <laughs> um, but when I was, we were flying up to cruise ships. And this last summer, I flew out, or last summer, I guess it's summer now. Um, I flew out to Alaska multiple times to get on a cruise ship to perform almost usually that night. And they, because of pricing, they would always put us on the cheapest flight, which was always a red eye. And so I'd be flying overnight. I would, and so I had to learn how to really take care of my body in a way that was like, I drink a ton of water. I have my giant 32 ounce Nalgene that's bright green, so I always know where it is. Um, and I drink like at least three of them a day. I um, 
I bought a thing for uh, flying actually called a humidifier. Yeah. And um, it kind of like helps keep your voice moist on a plane when you're on long flights. Um, and I found that was huge for me. Um, I Anytime I'm doing a demanding vocal show, I pretty much try to avoid any alcohol at all. Um, that can just, it just dries you out. And I usually I'm just like, I get paid to sing. I'm lucky enough to be paid to sing. I shouldn't risk it by having a night out. <laughs> um, I don't smoke. Um, I also, anytime I'm doing something like the show that I do, uh, guest entertainer wise is it's an incredibly demanding saying it's all pop music and all of the songs are, were written to be recorded in a studio with like eight layers of tracks and not sang live in a course of a, a two hour show. And so uh, it's a big stamina, um, challenge. And so I always make sure that I'm completely warmed up before I try to do anything from the show. Cause it's so high. So I don't want to just jump into it and end up straining myself. And then, um, the other big thing that I've learned for me is um, location-wise, my allergies can really act up in different ways. And I did a show in Atlanta about a year ago, and I had never been in the South for spring. <laughs> and I didn't really, I've never really had that bad of allergies, but um, the pollen down there just took me out completely. And so just like learning basically everything about my body, taking care of my body, and making sure that comes first has been a huge help. <laughs> um, are there particular warm-ups that you do that you find are, are effective? Um, yeah, I would say I most of my normal warming up is pretty just like a typical vo vocal warm-up that you'd see most people do. I start with lip trills. I actually wrote it down so I could read it off. <laughs> um, I usually start with lip trills and like just warm it up gently to make sure I'm not going to strain anything, especially if it's like first thing in the morning or I haven't gotten a lot of sleep because of travel or something like that. Um, and then I'll usually open that up to like scales on an aval and like um, I'll do like sustained like mime mamo mu exercises to make sure that I'm like in the right bright place. Um, and then once my voice feels warm, if I have to, if I have to start warming up to like more rock, like high stuff, um, I actually still do the warm up that you taught me with um, I don't know how to explain it, but the ba warm up like oh, yeah. ba ba. <laughs> I remember doing that in college with you in. Uh, all of a sudden you were just like, I think you just hit like an E and I was like, I don't even know I could do that. And like, but I still do that warm up because it just gets me right in that really bright spot. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Sean is also a singer songwriter and he's going to demonstrate some of his belting techniques in one of his pieces. Hello, I'm Sean Doherty um, and I'm going to demonstrate some belting technique on my original song called Starting Point. Uh, one of the funny things about writing your own music is that you can control exactly what notes you sing and for some reason I make my songs way too difficult. But <laughs> oh, one more thing I wanted to talk about um, is what uh, my current voice teacher here in New York calls the crack sob. Um, and it's if you listen to a lot of pop music and especially a lot of pop musical theater, um, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's, it's when you sort of let your voice kind of crack a little bit to launch into the next note, and you'll hear me do it a lot in this song. It's kind of something that I was doing naturally just from growing up on pop music and then found out it's actually a legitimate technique. But um, in the song, I sing this uh, melody. It's, I don't want to be in a starting point. And then um, usually I'll kind of crack into it to kind of pop onto that note a little harder, and it's kind of like a fun stylistic thing. So instead of it just being like, I, it'll be, and uh, I find it's an incredibly useful tool and also it if you're auditioning for like a pop uh, musical or something it's an easy way to kind of get into the style uh, in a quick and simple way Bye. 
far too long And I think it's time I started winning I'll go up, I'll get out I'm sick of the doubt I am not your second chance Oh, I don't want to be another starting point So go Gaining upper range in your belting is similar to range extension in other parts of your voice. Don't be in a hurry. Do it healthily and do it by small increments. So add a half step at a time. And just because you've added a note on one day doesn't mean that it's solid in your voice yet. It doesn't mean that you can sing it softly. It doesn't mean that you can sing it on every single vowel. So don't rush that process. Focus on one half step, get everything working in that, and then focus on the next half step. And you'll be amazed over a period of time how much you've slowly added healthily into your range. Belting can be really powerful. Just make sure you're doing it in a healthy way. Make sure you're supporting your sound, that you've eliminated tension from your body and you're not raising your chin to try to hit high notes, that your tongue is forward, and that you place the sound forward in your mask. If you're belting and it doesn't feel right, one of those things or several of those things could be out of line. So just evaluate how it feels and what might not be working for you. Thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for more chapters to come.